As we continue on with our afternoon session in the uh, general theme of sustainability, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Carson Meredith. He is also the James Harris Faculty Fellow in the School of Chemical Biomolecular Engineering. I heard earlier from Naresh Dadani that materials spans all sorts of different schools and uh, entities around Georgia Tech. He also is the executive director of what we call RBI, the Renewable Bioproducts Institute, uh, which is a similar institute, IRI, uh, like, like the Institute for Materials is. Carson, please. All right. Thank you, Judd. Appreciate it. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about our work today. Um, so we're going to talk about, take a little bit different direction than some of the other inorganic materials and talk about some organic materials. And uh, the problem that we're trying to solve is the problem of functional barriers that are used in packaging. Um, in many cases, uh, you have multi-layer flexible packaging that's used to preserve food, uh, also pharmaceuticals, even electronics. And while these are critical to product uh, shelf life and food safety, one of the problems is, is that they're multi-material by design, and most of the barriers we're talking about blocking or preventing moisture diffusion or oxygen diffusion and other gases into a product. Um, usually you have different layers to achieve those different functions, and then there are oftentimes adhesives or tie layers to bind them together as well. Um, the scale of the problem is really large in that um, you look at the, the share of flexible packaging, and this was five years ago, it was 40% of packaging types. And if you do the math, that's about 1 trillion pieces of plastic um, annually. And, and all of these by this design are essentially end of life uh, to dispose all, and a small percent are incinerated for energy. So. Our work is really looking at providing new materials that could be biodegradable, that could be renewable, uh, that would have different end of life outcomes than going to a landfill. And key property there at the initial outset is oxygen. So that's, that's the gas that really needs to be um, slow down, you can't prevent it really from going in, but you can really slow it down. Um, and if you look at oxygen permeability, uh, this is kind of the volume of oxygen that goes in to a package over time. Um, and you want to be in the shaded region for most fresh foods. Uh, it's a good guideline um, for fresh foods around 50 to 80 percent relative humidity, room temperature. Um, so the way that's done today is that different um, typical con uh, conventional materials, many of them petroleum derived, are combined. Those are the ones in blue. So you might take a good water barrier like polyethylene and a good oxygen barrier like ethylene vinyl alcohol and some adhesive uh, to join them together. And, and you would end up in this range of oxygen permeabilities uh, when you chose the final thicknesses. Um, but there are options that come from biomass. In other words, they come from naturally occurring materials, and they come from large sources of naturally occurring materials. Um, and these are, are cellulosic and chitin-based nanomaterials. And these uh, cellulose and chitin have oxygen permeability baselines that are really close to this range. Uh, the challenge is that uh, the other polymers are thermoplastics. They're things that could be melted in general and, and processed um, through conventional manufacturing techniques. The, uh, the biomass options are, are, are building blocks. They're not single molecules. They're, they're nanofibers or crystals that have to be formed into films by letting the building blocks essentially assemble, in, usually in water and then the water is dried. And that's quite different in terms of manufacturing than the melt processing uh, with the conventional materials. The other thing is these values in orange are very slow, slow developed lab um, samples. So they're, they're dried in a Petri dish uh, 
over a week, for example. And that gives it time for the blocks to self-assemble and align, and, and they um, eliminate major voids, and you get a good gas barrier. So what we're trying to do is, is how do we develop structures and processes that utilize these cellulose and chitin materials that can be manufacturable at scale. So one of the materials we're interested in are the cellulose nanomaterials. So these are um, rods or blocks, prismatic uh, crystal segments that are composed of cellulose molecules. So they're, they're carbohydrates and they're found in plants um, such as trees and the major industrial source today would be wood pulp. Uh, that's used as part of paper making. Uh, but these can be extracted and there are commercial and pilot facilities. Uh, this is a commercial product now. Although it's made in relatively small quantities, it is a one that can be scalably produced. Uh, they're highly crystalline and because they're highly crystalline, they can um, really reduce oxygen diffusion uh, in the crystal lattice. If you can get them to form together into films um, with close spacings, then the entire film can be low oxygen diffusion. So there's a, a U.S. Forest Products pilot lab uh, that was built before some of the commercial labs, uh, commercial uh, sites were built. That's where we get most of our uh, research grade materials. Titan is also a carbohydrate um, it has a slightly different structure than cellulose, as we'll see in a minute, but it also forms these hierarchical um, structures in nature. And at the base of that structure, you have the chitin molecules that hydrogen bond and form chitin nanocrystals or nano whiskers. And so these, these can be um, obtained. The largest industrial available source is from food processing waste, so crustaceans. Uh, they, they also can be obtained from fungi like mushrooms, so they could be grown or farmed, and even insects. So, so I'd like to talk a little bit about how we, we process the chitin because um, at the outside of this work, at least, these were not commercially available, so we had to learn how to, to make them in the lab. And essentially, uh, it's a fairly straightforward process in terms of chemistry. Uh, but you, you have to remove the proteins and the minerals with base and acid. And then uh, essentially there is a, um, you get purified chitin. It's a milky dispersion. Then this break out the chitin nanofibers. This can be sheared. So we use a high pressure homogenization, although other forms of homogenization can be used. But homogenization is essentially imparting energy to defiber or defibrillate. And you can end up with uh, chitin nanofibers, what we call CHNFs, which are relatively long. Um, or you can get these shorter, what we call chitin nano whiskers, all right? And th to get the whiskers, you have to do an additional step. It's called deacetylation. Um, it, it strips off acetyl groups from the chitin um, and leaves behind primary amines. Those can be charged under slightly acidic media, and you get a much stronger charged particle that can break apart into smaller pieces. So then these are the crystalline segments of the chitin that um, have higher, higher crystallinity and, and better barrier properties, if, as we found. So we'll talk some about how we can optimize by going from the chitin whisk fibers to the whiskers. Um, these uh, two sources of, of nanomaterials are oppositely charged. So the, the cellulose typically carries a negative charge due to sulfate groups on the surface. Chitin typically carries a positive charge because of amine groups that get protonated. Um, so we're gonna look at different ways of combining these together. And when we started, our idea was to find a synergistic way to combine them where the electrostatic attraction would drive them together at interfaces and form dense um, interfaces that would block gas diffusion. 
so the layering approach is, is the first one we took. Then we'll talk a little bit about blending, but uh, the chemistry is here that the, you have the six-membered glucose and sulfate groups along the backbone on the kite on the CNCs, and they're, uh, they pick up a negative charge from that. Um, the chitin is very similar. It has a six-membered and hydroglucose backbone, but it contains these acetamide, so it's, it's an amine type of group um, uh, with the NH plus an acetyl group, but some of these acetyls can be stripped off. In fact, all of them could be stripped off um, with a if you hydrolyze this um, carbon nitrogen bond and you end up with a primary amine in slightly acidic around pH three can be protonated and you get a charged positive um, polyelectrolyte um, particle, whereas the, the CNCs are anionic. So the first study where we, we searched for synergistic behavior was looking at layering. And we, we started with a PLA, polylactic acid substrate, because we needed something to support the materials. And we looked at putting layers, alternating layers of these materials to see if were the layers with, with two better than the layers with just one layer. Was there a synergistic effect of combining these oppositely charged materials? And lo and behold, there was. Um, the PLA um, oxygen permeability was up here um, with one layer of chitin or cellulose, um, the black or the green. There's no change or improvement. Um, the, with two layers, when you have the bilayer of the two different materials, you all of a sudden see a, a step change to better, lower oxygen permeability. So in other words, uh, it's a better barrier material. And in fact, it gets into the range of polyethylene terephthalate, uh, conventional um, petroleum-derived polyester. And as you add more layers, it, it doesn't really change the fundamental behavior. Um, it actually, it's that first bilayer that you put on there that gives you the, the enhanced permeability. And so if, if we look back at that original chart, these, these were chitin nanofibers and we were spray coating them on. So this is a spray process. And they, it dries very quickly. So it dries in a few minutes. So this is, is very manufacturable. Um, in, in some sense, much more than letting them dry in Petri dishes. Um, but because they're drying so fast, um, they don't have time to align and pack really tightly. Uh, we're relying on the electrostatic attraction at the interface to, to get them to get a dense interface, and that's what's really slowing down the diffusion. So, we did this with the chitin nanofibers. We're in this range, but we want to go lower. We want to get over here. So um, the next thing we did is we started thinking about optimizing the charge of the chitin um, because that's something we could control in our lab uh, uh, by deacetylating, taking these acetyl groups off. And that's when we started making the chitin nano whiskers. Uh, we discovered that having them more highly charged, you can um, get the same, you can get much smaller crystals, same amount of um, shearing and energy input when you when you do the homogenization. So we, we designed a, um, a materials uh, design of experiments here where we looked at three of the factors that really controlled the extent of deacetylation on the chitin. And we spread those out on the, on the design grid, uh, with nine, nine orthogonal uh, samples and at different combinations and found that those give you different lengths and diameters of the fibers. So, and the general theme is that as you go to higher intensity of the deacetylation, you actually get um, a higher, um, a lower degree of acetylation. So you go down you know, from around 94 to as low as 75% acetyl groups, and you get shorter and thinner fibers. So, so the question is, what effect did this have on the oxygen permeability? Um, and essentially looking at these samples, it, as you go from one to 
11, we're basically increasing the deacetylation intensity. And, and the major theme is that that gives you lower oxygen permeabilities. And um, we're able to get down to just under this 10, uh, which was an important one because is the highly oriented PET film available bottoms out around 10. So we're able to get just underneath the very best PET when we utilize these short chitin nano whiskers and then put them in layered structures. But this is still with the spray coating and we'd like to see if we can push this even farther with a something that would be more naturally uh, adapted to a roll-to-roll -roll process and that's familiar to the packaging industry. And so um, I joined together with several other colleagues here at Georgia Tech, uh, Misha Schaffner, Tequila Harris, and John Reynolds. And we developed a proposal to the DOE that, that was funded. And the idea was to use a different substrate, cellulose acetate, and put these bilayers and, and multilayers on, on that through a slot die coating process. So where the idea is with a single slot, you could put multiple layers simultaneously and deposit the chitin and cellulose um, in one loop, all right, one pass. And um, we looked at food packaging and also electrochromic displays. So these are printable circuits with polymeric inks uh, that can create displays. And that, that's the work of John Reynolds, actually. And so one result that, that we were really excited about, this is looking at the slot die coating in uh, Tequila Harris's lab. Um, we actually, she developed a, a dual um, chamber slot die. So uh, this, this dual chamber allows both materials to be pumped in to thin channels and they get deposited simultaneously. And the films, this is a, a typical film that gets coated out in, in this direction. And these, these are just small lab samples, about eight inches by four inches or so. And um, there with the slot layering, we get even lower values. And, and there's a range depending on the shear rate and other factors. But uh, we're getting really in, deep into this range where you're really commercially relevant. And we think that putting the, um, the cellulose and the chitin down simultaneously gives a more intimate mixing at the interface. And there's also shear in this process that helps align the fibers. So beyond looking at the oxygen permeability, I mentioned the encapsulating electrochromic devices. So these are um, model circuits that might go into packaging, but they could also go into display devices. Um, essentially, they're, um, they're polymeric substances that can be printed um, that respond to voltage biases by switching um, on and off. So the purple polymer here is the, uh, um, is the one that responds and, and it changes color depending on the voltage bias. So uh, what we um, were doing is finding a way to, to go away from the glass um, or a poly PET films that are typically used as a package to protect the film and, and go towards using these renewable substrates. And um, the idea is in the presence of oxygen and light, um, these um, photo bleach, uh, they undergo a photo bleaching process uh, that causes a loss of color and activity over time. So these were, uh, model printed circuits with just the two square colors embedded in two of our um, layers that I showed on the prior slide here, lot die coded ones. And um, if we look at, we put, we put these films into a, a sun test chamber that exposes it to um, an irradiance of, of one sun and over a certain number of days. And with just the cellulose acetate substrate, um, no barrier on it, they, they die pretty quickly. Um, but if you, if you have the slot die coated dual layer films that I, that I talked about with chitin and cellulose, they, they last longer. So 
and it depends on how thick they are and how what their barrier properties are. So the, the poorest performing ones actually were as good as PET um, at protecting from photo bleaching. Um, some of the better ones were almost as good as glass, actually, in terms of extending the lifetime of these devices. Um, and this is um, spend, spending eight full days out in the sun, essentially equivalent. So I, I promised to say a little bit about blending, um, the idea of using not just layering, but taking the fibers and directly mixing them so that not only do they see one another and their opposite charge at an interface, but they see the entire length of the fiber throughout the whole mixture. They're able to essentially aggregate um, in, the, in the mixture. So the blending actually works very, very well. Um, you get um, amongst the lowest um, oxygen barrier properties that we've um, seen, actually. Um, so they form very dense films where the chitin and the cellulose are very strongly um, associated together. They're, they're also a little more challenging to work with because you're taking two oppositely charged particles and blending them, and they, they begin to immediately aggregate and form larger particles. So the, um, the challenge there is, is finding a combination of composition and charge density where you get relatively slow aggregation, but still good, good barrier films. And a, a little bit about biodegradation. So we have run some tests on just soil biodegradation at room temperature. And uh, this is an ASTM test that looks at how much carbon dioxide the microbes and the soil are producing as they convert the chitin and cellulose to CO2 and water. And essentially, these, these tend to biodegrade very well. So the, the, subs, the, the layered ones biodegrade the quickest. And even um, at the end of their 65-day trial, they were close to 93% and uh, even better than, than just paper. And the blends biodegraded a little bit more slowly. Um, of course, we know that they have better oxygen barrier properties, so uh, they, it makes sense that they would degrade more slowly. But still, they're, they're, they're going close to 80% degradation. So what's a more complete story would be gained from thinking about the water vapor uh, properties as well as the oxygen. So if you look at um, oxygen transmission rate and water vapor transmission rate, um, you can see that there are different categories for different types of food, uh, where down here on the lower left corner is, is the driest, all right? And then these are foods that can be exposed to higher oxygen, higher water, um, but the open dots here are the ones from the studies I've just shown you. So we've moved into this range between about 0.5 to, um, to 5 or 8 in the oxygen transmission. All of the water vapor transmission are, are relatively high. Um, they're around 100 in the units here, grams per square meter per day. So um, the story is that if we want to move into um, to other types of packaging functions, we need to um, achieve better water vapor barrier properties. And so that's, that's where the ongoing work is, is, um, is happening now. And some of that's under industrial sponsorship, so we're, we're not quite ready to publicize it. But um, some of it involves using t additives um, that can uh, increase hydrophobicity. Um, some of it involves um, the way that you coat it to get denser layers and using certain types of substances. So, so the last, last thing I'd like to, to mention is, is the cost. So we've done some recent work um, looking at what would it actually cost to manufacture these types of materials because the the chitin and the cellulose. Um, the cellulose nanocrystals are commercially available, but in small volumes. The chitin, it was just in the last year that a company 
um, began making these chitin nanofibers and selling them. Uh, but it's still hard to get a hold of large, large quantities. Um, so we looked at um, a, a techno-economic techno analysis, um, looking at where would the cost to manufacture the chitin go um, if you were to scale this up to a large biorefinery. And then if you took that cost for the material and put it through a multi-station spray or slot die coder, um, how would that cost scale with the amount of area that you can coat? And, and as you see, as you scale up the amount of film area that you coat, um, at first you're just paying for the machine, um, but as you get lower and lower, you're paying for the materials only, okay? So um, essentially, we're, we're able to bottom out around 48 cents per square meter. Um, which is a projection based upon scaling up uh, the operations. And just to give you a comparison to packaging materials um, costs today, conventional materials, so they can range from um, 60 cents to $1.50 per square meter for single vacuum packs that, that might be used as supermarket. Um, large rolls, 3,100-foot uh, rolls, um, tend to be thinner, and you get a you, you get a, a scaling benefit there, so they're a little bit cheaper. But um, I think that you can see that, that this cost is is within the realm of possibility for um, when you compare it to conventional materials. And one of the reasons it works is because the chitin and cellulose layers are very very thin, so you don't need very much of them. So finally, this is uh, just wrapping up. We have biomass derived materials um, that can function in a circular life cycle through biodegradation um, or potentially um, through some type of recycling process. Um, we've moved towards lower and lower oxygen barrier targets, um, shown that it's compatible with layering or blending. And uh, can even be coated on other substrates like PET, which is itself recyclable, actually. And uh, finally, I'd just like to acknowledge uh, students. So some, the work in this particular talk, UAG and my group and TJ Jong uh, has done quite a lot of the work in uh, the Harris group, uh, postdoc Yang Lu and Eric Shen and the Reynolds group. And of course, uh, my, my collaborators and previous students and postdocs over the years. So thank you very much. Questions? We'll get to you next, because he's closer. <laughs> you mentioned a relationship between oxygen permeability and biodegradability. Is mm -hmm. that sort of a fundamental relationship or you, you sort, you, I don't think you really showed it per se, but right. I was curious. I think um, I think there there is some kind of relationship there. We're not sure what it is. It doesn't usually get talked about in the biodegradation literature, though. So, yeah. uh, hi, that was a nice talk. Why did you try layering first when mm -hmm. the blend seemed almost as good? Mm -hmm. So um, I think that um, when you look back, hindsight is 2020, right? <laughs> so I think that, yeah, right. That's correct. Yeah. Part, yeah, that that's part of it. And, and when you look in the um, the natural structures of chitin and plant cell walls, you you do see layers like this. Um, the other thing is that the, the blending, you know, common sense in, in the colloids community says don't blend oppositely charged particles together because they're just going to crash out. Not going to work. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it does work. <laughs> Thanks. So you show that when you do the deacetylation that your particles are getting smaller. And I don't, or your chitin particles are getting smaller. I don't know the size of your CNCs, but do you attribute that to any of like the size matching of the particles versus mm -hmm. just 
matching of charges? Yeah, that's a good question. That's absolutely right. The chitin, when they get shorter, they're closer to the size of the cellulose nanocrystals, and the charge densities are much closer matched. And yeah. And then going off that, have you looked at like just cellulose fibers, like the larger size, or are those too big for the? So those we we stayed away from just because um, it's it's been covered by some other groups actually to do the, the longer cellulose fibers. Thanks. So, mm -hmm. Any further questions? Push up here real quick, make sure there's nobody online. Plenty of people online, just they're very tentative. Nope, no questions. Okay. Carson, thank you much. Yeah, thank you.